Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank Stefan, not just for inviting me, I'm quite happy that he invited me, but for inviting so many people from so many different disciplines so we can look at consciousness from many, many different angles. And I'd also like to thank McIver for introducing my animals for me and giving me a good format so that I can continue talking about this whole problem of what happens when we want to understand about consciousness in an animal is just not like us, okay? And Stefan asked me to talk not about the hard problem about whether octopuses do have consciousness or other cephalopods, but about why they might. So what I'm going to cover in this talk, the first why I'm going to cover is an evolutionary why, and I'm going to point out that they evolved at the same time as the bony fishes and that maybe we can blame the fish. Then I'm going to talk about what I'd call ecological whys, and one of the ecological whys is something that Malcolm was talking about, which is navigation. And the second ecological why I'm going to talk about, which he also introduced, thank you, is finding food in a complex environment. And the third ecological why that I'm going to talk about is evading a whole complex guild of predators. And if I have time, I'm going to talk about the skin system because it's such a fascinating and beautiful one. Um, okay. Well, one of the things that we might say why about is it's a mollusk. The octopus is a mollusk. The, the octopus, cuttlefish, and squid are fairly closely related. Why would animals that are complex and cognitive and intelligent and also might have consciousness, why would they come from? This is, if you've had mool and freet, this is mool, this is mussels, okay? So why would they be related to the mollusks, which are pretty simple animals? Um, but before we get too smug, we should realize we're related to these guys. These are tunicates, they're very primitive chordates. And they start off with a notochord as we do, but then they lose it and become sessile marine filter feeders, okay? So clearly evolution is quite capable of taking quite different kinds of ancestry and generating very interesting and very wide-ranging animals. And one thing that I'd like to point out, by the way, is that 98% of the animals on the planet are invertebrates. And we've only had three talks about invertebrates. There's an awful lot of fish, too. We've only had one talk on fish. So there are many, many different opportunities in studying invertebrates, and I hope more people will be stimulated to study them. Now, I was thinking about this when I was preparing the talk, and I thought, well, Evolution is obviously getting you to the point where you survive and you reproduce and you survive some more and you reproduce some more. And in fact, horseshoe crabs, by this definition, have absolutely got it right. Because horseshoe crabs have been the same for 315 million years. Same model, good survival value. So that's not what we do, but they have it right. And we have to get it right in a completely different way. I would argue that humans, mammals, cephalopods are in fact a work in progress in the sense that we learn, we think, we construct, we plan, uh, we cope with a complex environment by our reactivity and changeability, not like the horseshoe crab who's got it right in the first place. Though I have to admit, I think that the animal that's changing and learning and building and all sorts of interesting ways is more interesting, but it's still a different model. Okay, so given that the cephalopods evolved from shelled mollusks, which they probably did, what is it that they had to change in order to get to the kind of animal we see today? Well, the first thing that they did is they abandoned, metaphorically speaking, the protective shell. And being an unprotected animal in the marine environment is a major challenge. 
They evolved an efficient closed circulatory system, which allowed them to move, or somebody has described them as racing snails, okay? It involved them to move at speed. They condensed the ganglia. There's five pairs of ganglia in mollusks, and they condensed the ganglia into a single central brain, which actually has specific regions which are devoted to storing learned information. Okay, so they truly have a brain. They also have a quite acute vision and, and a lens type eye, which is actually the convergent evolution with the mammalian eye. It's just a bit better because it doesn't have the retinal, gang, retinal cells, the receptor cells out at the back of the retina. Okay, so sensory, neural, physiologically, they make big changes in order to get to be cephalopods. But why? Why evolve this kind of animal? If you go back to the Paleozoic, you discover that shelled cephalopods, it's hard to say, but um, okay, there are chambers in the shelled cephalopod, and the animal would live in this one, and then it would grow a new shell and live in the next one out. Slower than our modern cephs, but still very efficient animals. If you look in the Paleozoic, you go to any museum and you look in the paleontological section, you see nautiloids and belemnoids and ammonoids, and they were just dominant in the seas. What Packard believes was that when the bony fishes evolved, and it's true, they now dominate the seas, okay? Mammals are a sometime thing. So when the bony fishes evolved, this was the stimulus for what we call the coleoid cephalopods, the shellless cephalopods, that they simply had to, if you like, adapt or become extinct. And there's only one genus of nautiloids left now, the tiny, tiny remnant in the deep Indo-East Pacific. Okay, so they had to essentially evolve or die. So the why question in terms of why did they get to be like they are is the bony fishes made them. But one of the things that a couple of people have mentioned here and that, that MacIver made so very, very clear is that every species on the planet is in a slightly different motor and perceptual world. And it is that motor and perceptual world that we have to understand. So th this is just an example of a few of, whoops, that wasn't what I meant to do, a few of the cephalopods which are quite different. This one floats in the open ocean and has secondarily regrown a shell. This one's in midwater and it is practically invisible. Uh, this one has a sucker that hangs on to seagrass blades. There are many coleoids. Um, and I, I'm not just going to talk about the octopuses, but we know more about the octopuses than we know about the others. So every animal, and several people mentioned von Uxko his idea of the umwelt, the perceptual and also the motor world of the particular animal. Every species lives in a different umwelt, and every species extracts different amounts of information, different types of information, like the electrical information, from the world that they live in. And every animal, including us, could be argued to construct a world like, what do you see there? You see a triangle, right? Is it there? Sure. My students love this. <laughs> because it is there, but it's not given. It's constructed in our minds. So every animal is probably doing the same kind of thing, constructing a world from the limited information that it has. and. One of the things I want to think about is how are cephalopod worlds constructed? Now, no, mostly when we think about intelligent animals, we think about us, nice and simple. But there are intelligent animals that aren't at all related to us. Now, I, that's right, I can walk around. Um, I want you to notice this because it's kind of interesting and you're going to see it in several different pictures of octopuses. Here's the octopus eye, nice round structure. 
Here's the octopus um, pupil, nice slit pupil. Many, many animals, many predators cue into the presence of eyes in their prey animals. So what the octopus is doing, this particular octopus is fairly well camouflaged in the first place, but it's actually got localized camouflage because it's got a line of dark extending from either side of the eye. And they put this particular eye bar on when they're what I may call annoyed. So probably when you see most of these octopus pictures, you're going to see this because um, having somebody running off flashes in your face is probably a good stimulus for annoyed. <laughs> right. Okay. Not related to us. They're not on the vertebrate model physically, but I probably shouldn't say too much about that. So cephalopod means head foot. And here's the head. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't a foot, they're arms. And here over here is the sac-like mantle which surrounds the body. So we have head, body, feet, and they have body, head, feet. Okay. So they have a different model. And there's several different ways besides this. Okay, first I should say that what I'm talking about is based on lab studies and field studies, and, and I've kind of taken emergence from that, and so while I might not cite particular studies, they are there. And I suppose the answer to that would be when the book comes out, you can get the details. But I've done a lot of work in the lab looking at octopuses in particular. Uh, notice its eye bar. And they solve complex problems. They do mazes. They take lids off jars to get at crabs inside. They, they have a lot of problem-solving ability. They play, not social play, but motor play. And they have personalities, distinct individual differences. Okay? So that's some of the things that we have that we know that is behind what I'm going to talk about with the octopus. They may have simple consciousness. What, how are they different from mammals? Okay, the first thing that we learn about in terms of, okay, what do cephalopods have that's different is that they're not social, okay? And there are many, many people who say the evolution of high intelligence and consciousness came from trying to understand what your conspecifics were doing. Well, that doesn't work for these guys because they don't care until they're mating. Um, whoops, I have to get these buttons right. This, there's the eye, there's the slit pupil, and there's the eye bar on either side. And there, of course, are some of the suction cups on the arms. Okay, so you don't have to be social to be intelligent. Um, I'm quite sure that complex environments create a very great deal of pressure. And while we think of the rainforest as the most complex environment of the world, the answer is no, it's the most complex environment on the dry world, but the coral reef and nearshore environment in the warm oceans is by far the most complex, and that's where these guys live. Uh, this, by the way, is an octopus feeling around in the landscape for prey. And since it has eight arms, it can feel in a lot of places at once. Now, yes, they have a highly centralized brain, sort of. Okay, so here's the brain, here's the optic lobe, so the eyes would be out here. But for an octopus, three-fifths of the neurons are in the arm. So what that means is, and David Edelman mentioned this as well, that they have some centralized control and decision making, but they also have a lot of localized allocation of control in the motor output system to these many arms. Um, and while nobody has, as far as I know, ever figured out whether having manipulative capacity is necessary to the evolution of high intelligence, I have no doubt that it helps. Um, yeah, you know, not we're pressing the wrong button. By the way, there's the eye bar. So this animal will be feeling around in the landscape. Octopuses have 
a muscular hydrostat system, so they have no inherent bones, no in exoskeleton, no endoskeleton. They can loop an arm around and they can, theoretically, the movement of the arms has an infinite number of degrees of freedom, that, but people are beginning to look at how the limitations must exist, but they still have a very great deal of freedom of movement. And they have along the arm suction cups. And so they can actually reach out to a small item, pick it up with a suction cup, pass it from cup, suction cup to sucker, to sucker, to sucker, up to the mouth, okay? They can also, I love telling people this, they can take any of the suckers and instead of going and picking it up, they can move it sideways so that they have a pincher grasp. So we are very fond of saying, gee, we've got the pincher grasp with this finger and thumb and this finger and thumb. And these guys have the pincher grasp with hundreds of suction cups. As my professor discovered, much to his dismay, when he did, he was doing some surgery on octopuses and he'd anesthetize them and they'd recovered and they were fine and he went home and he'd tied them up, with, he'd tied up the wounds with surgical silk. If anybody knows how small surgical silk is, it's very, very, very tiny, okay? And he came in the next morning and the wound was gaping and untied pieces of surgical silk were down on the bottom of the tank. So they have tremendous manipulative capacity. It's lovely. Now the other thing that happened is that for no specific reason that I can think of, they developed absolutely fabulative, fabulous camouflage. Um, there is an octopus there. Where's my light? Okay, here is where the octopus is. And that's actually a bit of arm there too. Okay. And interestingly enough, talking about Unveld, these are animals that are color blind. They have only one photopigment. And yet they have evolved a fantastic camouflage system for fish receivers who do have color vision. Interesting problem. Do you want me to outline it again or can you see it now? I'll give you some more good ones, don't worry. Okay, so we have a bunch of different things that make us see the octopus as a different model. And I think that ecologically there are several reasons why they have had to develop complex cognition and acute sensation, good memory. One of them is mobility. And recently I was reading a book on animal thinking and, and I'm quite used to thinking of, okay, there's mammals and they have consciousness and there's my guys out here and they're on left field and they have consciousness. And these people argue that actually mobility is an interesting and challenging problem for many, many animals from many different phyla, okay? That you have to, as you were saying, that you have to figure out where you are and where you want to go and how you want to get there. And of course we know, for instance, that mammals have spatial maps in the hippocampus. We know that bees have a dance language and people are debating whether insects have spatial maps. I think that it's possible this is the same kind of challenge that cephalopods have, even though we haven't looked at it that much. But here's an old paper that I did that will give you the diagram of it, that will give you some idea of what might be going on. I actually got a lot of people to come and help me, and we've followed octopuses all day for several days in a row. This is quite a bit of work. And what we discovered with that this map shows so well, if I would learn to press the right button, here's the animal's home. And this is a period of four or five days during which we watched as it went out hunting and we watched as it came back. Now, the fact, of course, that it goes out and comes back means that it must have spatial memory. But what we noticed, and these are the long, these are the long hunting trips that were some short ones as well. If you look at the animal going out here and hunting and coming back, it's not retracing its path. It's got memory 
for where home is. And generally speaking, see, this is another one. An animal would go out quite quickly and hunt in a particular small area, and then at some point, I suspect, when it had enough food, it would come back home. But here's the first one. Here's the second one. Here's the third one. The octopus, over the period of several days, did not hunt in the same place. And when you think about it, this is particularly logical, because if you found a crab underneath that rock and you came back the next day, the crab would not automatically have reappeared. So they're wind-switch foragers. And the fact that they can remember over the period of several days where they were suggests they have procedural memory as well as spatial memory. And, and people have begun to do lab studies on this, particularly um, Ludovic Dickel's people in Cannes are looking at lab studies on cuttlefish, looking at um, left-right turning and what cues they use. And it turns out that if the dorsal vertical lobe is ablated, that this ability is lost. So there's, there's clearly a parallel to what's going on with mammals in the hippocampus and possibly also to insects. And I think this idea of navigation being a vital situation for developing cognition and perhaps consciousness is a, is a good way to pursue it. Okay, octopuses, on the other hand, don't stay very long in their homes. When I was studying these guys in Bermuda, it was a mean of 10 days. And when I was studying another species in Hawaii, it was approximately the same a little bit longer for the giant Pacific octopus. So what they have is a short occupancy period, wind switch foraging, and then they move to a new area quite quickly, forage in a new area, not territorial. And so they have to relearn. And, and I'm sorry this didn't come out very well. When I first started reading about consciousness and thinking about how it applied to cephalopods, I thought about Barr's attentional spotlight. And I thought, okay, here you have an animal that moves around a lot, has to learn a lot. I'm doing it again. Okay, you've got the, the sensory motor feedback loops, of course. I get information, I generate action. But more than not, that, in a new situation, you have to bring your attentional spotlight to bear assess what's going on, make choices and plans, and then all this sort of sensory motor circuitry, which I don't believe is in consciousness, can be used. So I think that because the animal's moving all the time, coming into new situations in a changeable environment, I think this is one of the reasons that it's got the need to have the attentional spotlight focused on new information. Okay, now the second reason that I think that cephalopods have evolved cognition and consciousness is that the near shore ocean environment is very, very complex. So an animal like an octopus has to find food in a complex and changing environment and they are to some extent generalists. I'll talk about that in a minute. Octopuses are exploratory animals. If you put one in a new environment, the first thing it'll do is go around and find out what's there. They're a manipulative animal. One of the people who studied octopuses said that if you put a floating thermometer in a tank with an octopus, it has a life of five minutes before the animal's taken it down and taken it apart. Okay. But one of the things that's fascinating is that they actively seek information. And this, I think, has something to do with the attentional spotlight. So if an octopus is sitting there looking at something, it may do an action, but it may do what's called a head bob. Now, they have lateral eyes, which means they don't have good depth vision like we do when we have binocular eyes. Okay. But if you move like this, or as some mammals do, you move sideways, then what you do is you induce motion parallax, and that gives you depth information. So this is a case where octopuses seek out more information in a situation that presumably, if you'll pardon the expression, they want to know more about. Now, I think maybe, you, does everybody know about the octopus and the coconut? <laughs> 
Well, this was a paper a couple of years ago. People working in the Indo-East Pacific discovered that octopuses that don't have shelter but have to find some kind of shelter would go out on the muddy, sandy areas and they'd get coconut shells that somebody had opened and they'd clean them out and then they kind of carry them over top of them and then when they wanted to rest, they'd pull themselves in the coconut shell and pull the pieces together and go to sleep. Okay. But what's interesting about this is that they're clearly anticipating a future situation and manipulating the environment. And that's tool use, but there's other ways in which they have tool use. So they're manipulating the environment for a future gain. Okay. I put this together from many different observational studies and research studies, and this is probably what the octopus is doing when it is going out foraging. It's quite complex. It's, they're not just sort of blundering across the landscape picking up what they find. They're doing saltatory search. All these things must go into the decision whether to hunt. But their primary search is visual search for a likely area to hunt. So an octopus hanging around on this surface coming from here wouldn't go like this. It would jet to an area like a crack, uh, like an area with sand, like an area with a lot of algae that might have small crabs, a rock that it could go underneath. And so it would visually primarily search for a particular area. And then it would make a secondary search, which is chemotactile. They have one wonderful behavior, which I called web over. They come up to a rock and they go over top of it. They bring down the web between the arms, completely surround the rock and feel underneath the rock to see what they've caught. Okay. So, and of course the decision to return is something they must do. And in this study in Bermuda, we discovered that the distance to home was the basic indicator of whether they would take food home or whether they would find some sheltered place out, which is interesting because it's sort of like, well, you know, it's three blocks to McDonald's. I suppose I'll eat the hamburger there. Or it's a block to McDonald's. I'll take it home. I can turn on the TV and put my feet up. So they're making this kind of decision kind of like we are. Um, and they are specializing generalists. It took us a while to realize this, but the population is often generalist in terms of their prey. But individuals may be thoroughly specialist. This, and there is an octopus there, locked into scallops. And it's probably sitting there, because scallops are pretty easy to get, it's probably sitting there eating scallops and scallops and scallops. Now, lately I got curious about why some of them are specialists and some of them are generalists. And I think maybe it comes from their personality. And I think that we should be studying individuals, not species and populations. I think we don't do enough work on individuals, and I might point out that evolution is working at the individual level. Okay, so it might be that the particular personality of the individual affects the exploration, and then from exploration you learn, and as Mary Jane West Eberhardt pointed out, the learning, forgetting, and more learning cycle is very, very important. We tend to forget this, you know, we think that learning is important, but we forget that you have to make way for more information. And so it may be, and this is something that I will be working on, it may be that personality is affecting just exactly whether you're a generalist or a specialist in terms of prey selection. Okay, so that's, that's the second ecological influence that I was going to tell you about that I think that finding food in a complex environment is a pressure to the cephalopods having to evolve cognition, learning, intelligence. But when you get rid of the shell, you are 
automatically at risk for predation. Somebody described all the cephalopods, the octopuses, the squid, the cuttlefish, as simply a nice unprotected package of protein. And they have developed an escalating set of strategies to cope with predation pressure, which I think is extreme. Well, the giant Pacific octopus has tens of thousands of eggs. If you figure out that getting two to reproduction is the way that the life cycle would normally work, then clearly most of them get killed off before they get to adulthood, okay? So how do they work under risk of predation? First thing they do is they minimize the time exposure. And they stay in shelter or, like the octopus with the coconut, they go take it with them. And then they have to decide when eating how to do this. Okay. Now their primary defense is probably camouflage, which is a combination of color, texture, and posture. And this often avoids the predator detecting them. Now there's skin match to habitat, there's disruptive appearance which they can do, and there's also mimic of other species, mimic of fish species. So there's many ways in which they can change their appearance so that the predator won't notice them. If the predator does notice them, their secondary defenses can be change in appearance. So I'll show you the dematic display later, and I showed you the eye bar. But let's say that the predator approaches and they have tertiary defenses, departure. Sometimes they deal with sequence of appearance. There's a little squid called Euprimnon. It's about that big. And I was out looking at it at dusk in Hawaii. And you reach for it, and it has been dark. And it juts out a little ball of ink, which is also dark, pales, and leaves. So the predator's sitting there going after what it thought was the animal, and meanwhile, the real animal's gone. Um, they may go to shelter, they may dig into the sand. They also shoot out ink, which can be a distraction, as I mentioned, but which can also be what we might call a smoke screen. And it also impairs the chemoreception of fish predators. So, in order not to be eaten, what I would call an intelligent animal has had to develop a bunch of adaptive strategies. Okay. Here's what I call predator-sensitive foraging. I'm glad I'm not that octopus. Okay, here it is there, right? And here's the fish, and here's the fish, and here's the fish, and here's the fish. Hmm. Okay, now I'm gonna mention a study I did in the Caribbean. I have very good taste in research sites. <laughs> they now it's really interesting thinking about squid because they're in midwater, right? That means you're at risk from up there and from down there and from the left and from the right and from the front and from the back. So you're really, really, really vulnerable. And they have to do very careful risk evaluation. And when we actually studied them, they were kind of hanging around in the water doing very much, not very much. They departed from where they were eight times an hour. Okay, so I think the word jittery is probably fair. Some, and both the change in their appearance and the amount of avoidance escalated. So they'd go from zebra to, this is a dot, thematic dots, to white, and they go from sort of vague avoidance to moving a couple of meters to gone. Okay, because they're very fast when they want to be. But I was interested in the sex displays, and, and they didn't always do sex displays, so I had people watching to see what they were doing in avoidance, and we got lots and lots and lots of data. I have 256 observations of what a squid did when a parrotfish came by, for instance. So I looked at the most common species, and, I, and we looked at size in squid length, speed, and speed of approach, sorry, size, speed, and distance. And for the three most common species, the bar jack, um, the yellow-tailed snapper, and the parrotfish, different combinations of these triggered the animal to go away, okay? And this has been found to be true in cuttlefish and squid as well, that they have figured out 
just exactly which fish you are, and then they behave differently to you. So for instance, with the cuttlefish, they don't use displays to dogfish. Well, dogfish use chemical cues, so it isn't any use using visual displays. So they have learned, and I suspect fairly strongly, that what they are learning is the movement pattern of the fish's fins in making distortions in the water. So I suspect that it's not just sight, it's probably also touch. So they're very, very sophisticated about when they should leave and how fast they should leave and what they should do about the display. Okay, how long have I got? Five, Five minutes. Notice I've talked about navigation, I've talked about finding food in a complex environment, I've talked about avoiding predation. I just want to talk about this skin display system because it's so neat. Is that fair? That's a cuttlefish. That's a squid. This guy's an octopus. Notice this particular octopus doesn't look like the background, but it doesn't look like an animal either. And here's the skin papillae raised over the eyes. In this case, the eyes here, and they've put on this big white distractor spot below the eyes, so you really don't see this as an animal. And cuttlefish do this very well. Can you see the cuttlefish? <laughs> see it? It doesn't look exactly like the background, but it looks close enough, and you just don't see it. Now, several different people, Hanlon and Chow and Osorio, have been doing some work quite recently looking at putting cuttlefish on backgrounds and changing the background and figuring out, because one of the things that we think is interesting is to what extent does the animal have any conscious access or does it have, is it only open loop? What is it that causes it to make this camouflage, heaven help us, and how much does it know about what it's making? So they've been doing different kinds of backgrounds and they describe it as the assessment goes past this sort of immediate sensory to Mars 2.5D construction of the visual world. Okay, but I promised that I'd show you a daymatic display. This, this is a display that happens at threat, but not very high threat, okay? And what it's clearly doing, no, don't wanna do that, is it's outlining its eyes to make them big, it's spreading its arms to make itself look huge, and it's actually making the edge of all this look dark. I should explain, by the way, that this is a chromatophore control system which is under immediate neural control and they can change appearance in 35 milliseconds and they can change appearance in probably um, a square millimeter. They have a wonderful system. But this one clearly is a I'm really big keep away kind of startle threat system. And I suppose I have about two minutes. Well, about 12 years ago, no, it started sooner than that. In 1975, I think it was, Martin Moynihan said that he thought that squid made a visual language on their skin. And all the cephalopod community were very, very excited about that, and we all waited around and waited around. And in fact, he worked on birds, he went back to work on birds. He left the idea and some description of the kinds of things he thought they did, but he didn't go forward with it to find out whether the assumption was true. So I thought, well, okay. Now, they have a complex display system, so this is the basic. Uh, this is actually zebra. A very bad zebra. We call this one plaid, and notice what they do with the arms. Yeah, it is plaid. Uh, this, where am I? Worried? There's a male in stripe and a female in saddle, and actually the saddle's a little bit darker. This is a really interesting guy. This is, this is a male that's in consort with a female, and she will be over here, so he looks like this to her. But to all the other squid, 
he looks like spotlight. Keep away, get away, okay? They do that at about two meters distance. Uh, so interestingly enough, they can make a display on one side of the body and not the other, or they can make a different one on one side of the dis body than the other. Now, I want you to say that again. They can put a stripe on this side, and actually this one doesn't have a stripe on that side. They can put a stripe on this side and a zebra on this side, which is sort of like talking out of both sides of your mouth. I can't do it. And in the end, I don't think that they do make a visual language. And there's two reasons why I think they don't make a visual language. The first is that these are fairly stereotyped. It makes sense that they're reproductive displays, but they're fairly stereotyped. They're not creative. The second thing is, if you look at the characteristics of language, and I'm obviously two years late on this one, um, they do not comment on externals. They're only displaying their internal state. Got a lovely display system. They could make a language. I think they haven't because they haven't yet got anything sufficiently interesting to say. Okay, here's some of the things we don't know. Ha, sure. We know almost nothing about these animals. We're getting there, but we really have an awful lot to learn, and they're a wonderful model for understanding cognition. Okay. Have we got an eye bar? Yeah. There's the eye bar. And I think that, and Kathy would, would agree with me, and maybe Malcolm would agree with me, I'm not sure, but I think that I learned a lot about the complexity of the animal's behavior and the complexity of their system from combining lab and field work, but particularly from doing field work. I think if you want to understand a complex animal, you cannot bring it into the lab, ask it simple questions, and get simple answers. I'm sure I ran over. <laughs>